Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. If you could please um, start taking your seats. And it is really hard to see everybody out there, by the way. <laughs> Uh, my name is Angela King and I'm the Assistant Director of the Virginia Coastal Policy Center at William & Mary Law School. And I'd like to welcome you to this morning's panel, Virginia's Native American Tribes, the Changing Landscape and Resulting Challenges and Opportunities. Before I go into the details regarding the purpose and structure of today's panel, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Stephen Atkins of the Chickahominy Tribe to provide an invocation. Good morning. I bring you greetings from the Chickahominy Indian Tribe. Musha Wanato, Cheskata Kawat, Woshiwa Womanana. Great Spirit, loving Father of all nations, we invite your presence here today. Father, I pray that uh, as we have engaged in this conference over the last several days, that we'll, we will leave with the resolve to protect this great environment, Mother Earth, that you entrusted to our care. May we strive to leave our imprint on an environment that is much healthier than the one that we entered. Again, we ask your presence here today, and we pray that there will be many positive results from the collection of thoughts and ideas and the minds that have assembled here over the last several days. I hope. Thank you, Chief Adkins. So during this session, we will explore the challenges and opportunities that arise as some of the tribes change their relationship with the Commonwealth and the federal government. And our focus will be on areas of environmental regulatory programs, funding and partnering opportunities, and natural resource priorities. This is the first time this important topic has been covered here at Environment Virginia. And we're hoping that today's discussion will be a springboard for further conversations on this topic. One change to note from what's listed in the program is that unfortunately, Dr. Spivey was not able to be here with us today, but Lauren has graciously agreed to cover the information that Ashley was going to present. So thank you, Lauren. <laughs> and um, today's panel will be divided into three different sets of presentations. And we do ask that you hold your questions until the end after all the speakers have presented. And I'll just take a minute to introduce all the speakers. Our first set of presentations will look at state and federal recognition here in Virginia, as well as discuss work being done on the Pamunkey Reservation to mitigate the impacts of climate change on the tribe's cultural resources. You'll hear from myself, as well as Lauren Fox on the other end of the panel table. Lauren is a member of the Pamunkey Indian Tribe and the director of the Pamunkey Indian Tribal Resource Center. She manages several grants as well as working groups for the tribe. And these working groups include um, issues associated with cultural resource management, natural resource management, education, and economic development. The second set of presentations will focus on work the Pamunkey and the EPA have been doing over the past year with a specific focus on general assistance program grants. And again, we'll hear from Lauren Fox, as well as Samantha Beers, who is seated next to her. Samantha is the director of the Office of Communities, Tribes, and Environmental Assessment and has been with the EPA since January of 1991. Prior to her current position, she was the director of the Office of Enforcement, Compliance, and Environmental Justice. In our third set of presentations, we'll look at recent invest investments the Coastal Zone Management Program has made in research and planning for the Lower Chickahominy Watershed and explore the role of the Chickahominy Tribe as important partners in the project. We will hear from Sharon Baxter, who directs the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality's Division of Environmental Enhancement, which includes the agency's Office of Pollution Prevention, Office of Environmental Impact Review and Long Range Priorities, and the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. We'll also hear from Chief Atkins. He retired from EI DuPont in 2006 after 40 years of service and worked for the Commonwealth of Virginia as the Chief Deputy Director in the Human Resources Department under Governor Kane's administration. Steve currently serves on the Board of Directors of Argent Credit Union and is committed to community involvement as he volunteers with several other organizations. So first up, I'm gonna um, 
provide a quick overview of state and federal recognition here in Virginia, and then introduce some work that the Virginia Coastal Policy Center is doing with state and federally recognized tribes here in the Commonwealth. Long before the English settled at Jamestown, Virginia's modern day tribes were firmly established here, and they're still here today. When the settlers arrived over 400 years ago, they were greeted by more than 35 different tribes. And over the centuries, the relationship between the Commonwealth and the tribal people has varied, to say the least. But today, my focus will be on the last 40 years or so, and more specifically on the state recognition process. In 1982, the General Assembly began a process to study and identify tribal groups that would be formally recognized by the Commonwealth. This process was handled largely through the Virginia Council on Indians, a formal body established to advise the General Assembly and the governor. To receive recognition from the council, a tribe had to meet certain criteria, such as show that the tribe's members had retained a specifically Indian identity through time, be able to trace the tribe's continued existence within Virginia from first contact to the present, and provide evidence of contemporary formal organization. In 2012, the council was disbanded, and in 2014, the General Assembly directed the Secretary of the Commonwealth to serve as the governor's liaison to the Virginia Indian tribes. In 2016, legislation was passed to allow the Secretary of the Commonwealth to create a Virginia Indian Advisory Board. Currently, this advisory board counsels the legislature and governor on non-recognized tribes seeking recognition. State recognition is a formal declaration of recognition to an American Indian tribe located in Virginia by the Commonwealth. It does not confer the same benefits as federal recognition. Virginia currently has 11 state recognized tribes. The Pamunkey, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Rappahannock, the Mattapani, the Upper Mattapani, the Charanhaka, the Nansaman, the Potomac, the Nottoway of Virginia, and the Monacan Indian Nation. As you might be able to see from this slide, I know the font is a little small, um, the majority of these tribes are located in the coastal plain region of Virginia, with the exception of the Monacan Indian Nation, which is located in the Piedmont region. These tribes range in population from about 100 members to more than 2,000 members. Many own land in some manner, but only two have state reservations the Pamunkey and the Mattapani, and both reservations are located in King William County. Additionally, many of the tribes honor their history and heritage by preserving historic sites, having cultural centers or museums, and holding traditional celebrations and ceremonies, such as powwows. Even given the rich history of tra and tradition of tribal people in Virginia, it was not until recently that the Commonwealth went from having zero federally recognized tribes to having seven the Pamunkey, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Upper Mattapani, the Rappahannock, the Nansaman, and the Monacan Indian Nation. The process for federal recognition is long. It often takes decades. It is complicated, and depending on the path chosen, includes specific historical and identity requirements that are difficult to meet. Federal recognition gives tribes legal status and requires the federal government to provide certain benefits Federally recognized tribes have a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States and are eligible for funding and services related to things such as housing, education, and health care. It's important to note that recognition is not the granting of a status. It's an acknowledgement that the tribal people are who they say they are, sovereign nations, and should be treated as such. Federal recognition here in Virginia has taken two paths the administrative process through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the legislative process through Congress. The Pamunkey were the first federally recognized tribe in Virginia and in EPA's Region 3, receiving recognition via the Bureau of Indian Affairs in January of 2016. Under the administrative process, the tribe had to demonstrate various criteria, including among other things, being able to identify as an American Indian entity on a substantially continuous basis since 1900, showing that a predominant portion of the petitioning group comprised a distinct community and had existed as a distinct community from historical times until present, and demonstrating that it maintained political influence or authority over its members from historical times until present. 
It's an understatement to say that this was not a quick or easy process, and it took more than three decades for the Pamunkey to be successful. More recently, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Upper Mattapanai, the Rappahannock, the Nansamund, and the Monacan Indian Nation, working together through the Virginia, Virginia Indian Tribal Alliance for Life, or VITAL, received recognition via the Thomasina E. Jordan Indian Tribes of Virginia Federal Recognition Act, which was signed into law in January of 2018. While still very time consuming and difficult, the legislative process doesn't include the same documentation requirements and can take less time. In this case, it took about 20 years. And I do wanna note that this was the first standalone tribal recognition bill to pass both chambers of Congress since the mid 1990s. As I mentioned earlier, the purpose of today's panel is to discuss this changing landscape and more specifically to consider the challenges and opportunities that may arise as some of the tribes change their relationship with the Commonwealth and the federal government. VCPC recently began a coastal zone management project to engage tribal representatives, both those state and federally recognized, to identify what questions and concerns they have regarding federal recognition and its relationship to natural resources management. For example, what are potential impacts to funding options, grant eligibility requirements, and the permitting or approval process for certain types of projects the tribe may want to undertake. VCPC is still in the early stages of collecting feedback from the tribal chiefs and members, but based on the conversations we've been able to have so far, we are seeing some common themes such as a desire to acquire land for purposes such as burial grounds or to provide educational programming, to develop comprehensive planning documents to determine both short-term and long-term goals and objectives for the tribe, and to work to improve existing cultural amenities, such as museums, historic structures, or gathering places for educational and celebratory events. VCPC is extremely grateful to the tribes that have met with us, welcomed us to their land, and shared their experiences, concerns, and hopes with us. And we're looking forward to future opportunities to speak with more of the tribes. Now I'll turn it over to Lauren to discuss work being done on the Pamunkey Reservation to mitigate the impacts that climate change is having on their cultural resources. Okay, um, just a brief overview. This presentation is a condensed version of what was given by Ashley, Dr. Ashley Spivey um, from the Virginia Coastal Policy Center Conference. So if you were lucky enough to hear that, this will just briefly go over um, what our reservation is doing to protect our natural and cultural resources. So I know environmental justice, environmental justice has been a topic um, over several sessions this symposium. As you can see from the map, our reservation is on a peninsula. We're surrounded by water on three sides. So climate change, sea level rise, saltwater intrusion, all of those things are very prevalent for us and we're dealing with that now and also planning for the future. We have a long history of managing and protecting our natural and cultural resources. Um, our museum and culture center was established in 1980. The reservation was actually um, established in 1646. So we've been here um, recognized by the state for quite some time. Uh, we, if you see the picture on the far right, um, we have clay veins which are impacted in um, several areas of our reservation by erosion. So we're currently working on shoreline restoration and management. Um, fishing is also um, one of our cultural practices as well as a natural resource to us. Um, our hatchery was established in 1918. Um, we are seeking funding and working with the VCPC to manage that and have a fisheries plan. So these are all the different things that we're working to address right now and then planning for the future. Um, we do have rapid erosion. We're working on having GIS layers done to see exactly how much land loss we have around the reservation. Um, we worked with Loma Mary, um, WIMCAR, to do a archeological project along the shoreline to survey um, our 
not only the erosion that's happening, but also um, to have a record of the archaeological um, sites on the reservation. So we had three different tribal members that were hired and trained to do field work um, with Lumen Mary. This grant was provided through VDHR, and that information will probably be public soon within our website. So what we're working towards the future, and also very ongoing, is definitely shoreline stabilization and restoration. Um, we hope to get a grant through EPA for a tribal wetlands management program, and um, we'll be working with VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, through Women Mary, um, treatment as a state, as Angela touched on earlier. Um, even though we are a sovereign nation, through EPA, we would have to get the status of a state to have um, the power and authority to designate our own water quality standards, things like that um, for the reservation, and then hatchery maintenance and expansion. Um, we're continuing to work with different agencies to water, uh, or to monitor our water, um, and we have grants for um, Endangered Species Act with NOAA um, to track the shad and the sturgeon in our waters because we are a very heavily based um, community for substantial uh, fish fishing. So I went over that very quickly. I'm hoping to have a lot of questions at the end. Um, so this was just a brief overview of what we're doing currently and then our plans for the future. So next we're, we'll hear from Samantha Beers and then Lauren again regarding work that the EPA and the Pamunkey have been doing over the past year or so. Good morning. So I know that this is not necessarily the most conducive environment for give and take, and it's hard for me to see all of you, so you're going to see me take my glasses on and off and look out at faces, because when I'm speaking, I'm usually looking at people to see if what I'm saying is registering in your faces. So bear with me. Also, I'm not great at pushing the button when I speak. So if I forget to push the button, then you have to say, next slide, and I'll remember. I, I promise. As I age, these things are getting even more difficult and exciting. Okay, so you've heard my name is Samantha Phillips Spears. Um, we're undergoing a realignment. I'm now the director of the Office of Communities, Tribes, and Environmental Assessment. Really excited to be part of that effort because as you've heard, the table's been set by two folks so far talking about the emergence of these tribes, federally recognized tribes in Virginia. So I like a nice challenge. I have great staff and I'm really looking forward to building this program. So what is EPA responsible for? We know you have a national office and we have a regional office. I'm based in the regional office. So we're charged with protecting human health and the environment. Um, there are 10 regional offices across the United States. Region three includes, as you see on my little map, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. We're responsible for managing the tribal relationships with the seven federally recognized tribes that fall within those boundaries. And you've already heard from two folks that all seven of those tribes are here in Virginia. We've also been working with the four state recognized tribes uh, because due to EPA guidance, if you're a state recognized tribe in America, we, uh, we consider you to fall under our environmental justice protocol. So I've been doing environmental justice since 1992. Um, I was first uh, an attorney responsible for managing uh, the legal relationships with those communities. And then starting in 1997, I was uh, responsible for running the environmental justice program. So I've been joking around with Lauren that in my past life, um, back in 96, when I was a staff attorney, um, due to the raw water study pro uh, project, I was down visiting with the, both the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey, the reservations and their powwows, which I went to for five years during that time period, dealing with the issue of whether or not there was going to be a large reservoir that went within the three-mile boundary around the Mattapanai site and went very close to the existing Pamunkey reservation. That The point of that reservoir was to store water to be sent uh, to southern Virginia to encourage more development. So I have a long-standing relationship with these tribes, and I'm pretty excited about reinvigorating those relationships moving forward. So the state-recognized tribes, as you've heard, are within our definition of EJ community. Um, you've heard a little bit from a couple different folks. 
about from Angela King first when she sort of set the table and explained the landscape. And then you heard Lauren uh, talk about it a little bit as well. I'm gonna go through this very quickly so that not to hit the point for the third time. But you know, we went from having 11 tribes that we considered part of our environmental justice community to seven federally recognized tribes. First, of course, with the Pulmonkey, they did the BOI uh, process, which you heard is a 30-year process, and I think 30 years um, is relatively short. Um, and it's a, it's a long process where a group of individuals coming together have to prove that they're the individuals that are linked together by tribal roots. Um, and then you've heard about the Thomas Cena Jordan Federal Recognition Act of 2017 with the six additional tribes. You've already seen this real briefly too, which is where they located. What, what we're waiting for, frankly, is for each tribe to sort of uh, decide where their boundaries are. And you're saying to yourself, well, they should know. But understand that with settlement, with development, um, you had areas that the tribes were used to, to frequenting for hundreds of years shrinking. So for many of you out in the audience, depending on, on what your, um, your rationale is for being here and what your focus is, it could be that you're doing consulting and you're trying to figure out for this one project, who do I need to talk to? I know I have to talk to DEQ. I probably have to talk to EPA. I may have to talk to FERC. I wonder if I need to talk to a tribe. When in doubt, talk to a tribe is my suggestion. Because if you've got burial grounds or artifacts that are spread throughout a certain area in Virginia that run along all the rivers, better safe than sorry, reach out to the tribe early. So in the case of your work, if you find something, you'll know where to go. So you've also heard folks, Angela King told you really briefly, you know what, the Virginia um, Indian Advisory Board said that they, they put in place a state recognition process, but it didn't confer the same rights as federal recognition. So you're saying to yourself, well, what's the difference? What do you get, what do you give up? I'd argue you give up nothing, and when you become federally recognized, a whole new world opens. It's an exciting new world that we all have to learn about together, so we're in this together. So what do we do with federally recognized tribes? US EPA and all federal agencies are responsible for providing training and technical assistance. So what, what does that mean within the EPA boundaries? Well, everything in the Clean Water Act, from water quality standards, drinking water issues, we're responsible for providing technical assistance. Um, for the Clean Air Act, ozone, transport, all those issues, Superfund cleanup issues, brownfields issues, these are all part of what we're responsible for making sure that we share with our tribes. So a lot of these trainings we're responsible for helping to pay for the tribes to, to attend. The goal of this whole federal recognition process is you wanna have this, the tribes have the ability to meaningfully participate in all these things. So wherever they are in terms of their environmental uh, knowledge and base, it's our responsibility to help build that base so that they're a better partner. We're also responsible for, as tribes begin to broaden their environmental programs and understanding, we provide technical guidance on a variety of issues. Everything from when you saw um, uh, Lauren give Ashley's overview speech, uh, 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 seawater infiltration, uh, soil erosion, uh, hatchery issues. There's people in our building that specialize in each of those areas, and if not in our building, then in the headquarters building. And it's our responsibility for providing that linkage so that that, that data can be transmitted. So um, before I get to that gap thing, I wanna go through some of the other things that we do. So for example, we're involved now in a consultation process. So when one of our states is doing a water quality issue, there's, there's a requirement that they consult, that US EPA make sure that the tribe has been consulted if they're, if they're uh, interested in, in participating in that process. In this particular one, we did reach out to the Pamunkey tribe and they are interested in the consultation process. And that's a process that takes some time Again, we have to describe what is the water quality standards program, what is the proposed change that in this case Virginia is proposing, how if at all make that affect the tribe. Uh, we provide technical guidance as they go through all those documents and increase their understanding of what it means and what, if anything, they might wanna say about it. So we serve as a convener of conscience, we serve as a technical base, allowing the tribe to more fully participate. We also will provide the tribe with written responses to all the concerns or comments that are proposed. So we get it all together and then we're a central person that can all transplant that back to the state as well. Um, here's the exciting part for some folks. Um, in addition to the additional rights that you get um, in the courts from being federally recognized, it also opens you up to a series of federal grants that our states get. So the tribes are now able to get many things that states have been getting. 
It's not a new pocket. It's not a different pocket. It's not a special pocket. They now get what the states get. The first of those is the GAP grant. And the GAP grant is, um, is a grant that allows for the, the tribe to begin to think about building their capacity and understanding what their issues are within the environmental realm. So we want folks to be able to have enough knowledge to promote and understand their own environmental programs. So we have a specific grant for that. It's general assistance grant. And in it, the basic first grant, although it is a long process to get the grant together, the first grant is for about $100,000. So it's not an insignificant amount of money. Um, they, we uh, send out to all federally recognized tribes in the United States, did you know that you have the ability to put your hand up and say you want to get involved in applying for this grant? Um, once they choose to apply for a grant, the GAP grant can fund things like a salary for the administrator or staff to even put together the initial grant. Um, it allows them to attend training exercises so that they are better able to represent their own interests and understand them. We pay for travel, training costs, per diem lodging, office supplies, things that make them more efficient and effective in doing their own work. Um, the grant work plan is really the key to all this. And you're saying, well, they get this money and then what do they do with it? They've got to come up with a work plan where they have to figure out what's important to them on the environmental issues that they can start to, to suss out. So we get them this grant, they apply for the grant, they put together a work plan, and that work plan can include anything from residential waste collection and removal, uh, as well as the other things I've listed. And when you're hearing this, think back to the things that Lauren already laid out that they're already concerned with. It's not a hard stretch to see that the things that she was concerned with were in fact in their GAP grant. So we went through this process. This is the specific process we went through with the Pamunkeys. Starting in November of 2017, we had an initial meeting. We laid out what is a grant, grant, GAP grant, what's the time frame for submitting this grant, what do we need from you by when, and what can we do to help you get it there. In spring, we had a work plan conversation and budget negotiations. In the summer, we were able to finalize the work plan and the budget, and we worked through all the grant requirements and, and the administrative forms. You know, we're federal government. We have a form for everything and a mnemonic for that form. So there's a lot that you have to learn in terms of alphabet soup, and we're here next to you as you learn it. In September of 2018, we submitted the, the Pamunkey GAP, GAP grant proposal. We reviewed that proposal, and the funds were dispersed. So it sounds like a long process. It, it sometimes has to be a relatively tight process, five, six months in order to get it done. Um, but I, I imagine during the, the uh, question period, there'll be questions about what folks have done with that money, and we're very happy to partner with the Pamunkey as they utilize that money. Um, so we've had tours of the land there at the, the Pamunkey Reservation at a variety of levels here at EPA. We've had some really good conversations with folks as we begin to figure out what it is they need from us as they begin to understand a little bit more about the environmental regulations and what they want in, on their own reservation and tribal land. If I could make the thing go one more. So I don't know if anyone else here in the audience, initially we didn't know how many folks from the other tribes would be here and we wanted to make sure that in addition to the letter that I sent out to all the tribal chiefs, that folks had a chance to hear. If you're interested in, in applying for a GAP grant, we need to hear from you as soon as possible because we were going to have to really mobilize hard to make the deadline of June 14th. If you want it, we'll, we'll move heaven and earth to help you make it happen. We can do our side. We need you to do your side. You reach out to me, Samantha Phillips Beers. There's my name, phone number. I'm also happy to come on over and give it to you. And Brian, who's here in the audience, give a holler, Brian. So, I mean, if this is something you're interested in, understand we have this amount of time for this year, but we are committed to helping you get there. So thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Lauren again. So this is our actual uh, tribal seal. <laughs> Um, Samantha, thank you for that. She went over a lot of great information um, on the process of the GAP grant, um, you know, how it's awarded, things like that. So I'm going to give the tribal perspective as to why it's important to us, how it's a stepping stone for future developments. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay. 
So we were the first tribe to receive um, GAP funding in Region 3. Um, we have four main components for the GAP grant. The first is outreach and education. Um, our staff is doing training to make sure that we have the knowledge to facilitate um, all the programs that are needed through the GAP grant. Uh, we are working on an integrated waste management plan. Um, one of the things that Samantha covered is waste removal on the reservation. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Kingdom County or the reservation, but it is fairly secluded. Um, up until the GAP grant, we didn't have any um, set standard for waste removal. We did have an open dump that's now been closed. Um, we are working with the county to have uh, waste removal and recycling, so now all of our members on the reservation have access to that, so that's something that's been great through the GAP program. Um, thirdly, uh, we are working with EPA to draft and adopt our ETEP, which is the EPA Tribal Environmental Plan. This will set forth all of our programs and priorities, everything that we hope to accomplish. Um, I'll speak more about that on the next slide. Um, and then last, we are working to build a foundation to have our own um, environmental protection program on the reservation, uh, set office so that everyone that we need to do consultation with us has a direct point of contact. Um, So the ETEP has four requirements um, to be approved through EPA. You have to identify the different programs and priorities. There's a list of like 30, I think it's 32 pages for uh, capacity building and um, components through the ETEP. You have to identify, um, you know, what EPA will be responsible for, the different management requirements, uh, do a whole list of inventory for regulated, regulated entities and then also identifying the mutual roles and responsibilities. Moving along. So why is this important to us as a tribal um, government and nation? This sets forth uh, communication for shared governance. Um, the reservation is a part of Virginia. Uh, coastal planning is important no matter where you are, or who you are. So this just creates joint responsibility with the tribal governments and the state and federal agencies. Um, having an ETEP and going through the GAP process allows for treatment as a state, which Samantha spoke about. Um, this is updated annually, so it's not something that we write and we set aside and we forget about. It's a constant um, back and forth between EPA and the tribal governments to make sure that we are both doing what needs to be done to protect the environment. So this is just, this is not an extensive list whatsoever. These are just the projects that I've been currently working on, um, consulting with different agencies, the grants that we've received. Um, we've worked very closely with the Virginia Coastal Policy Center um, and VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science through William & Mary. Um, we're working with EPA for our ETEP. We're doing consultation with them for water quality standards. We're um, hoping to continue conversations with DEQ We've received a grant through NIFWIF um, for the Living Shoreline. There is pictures on the previous presentation about that. Um, and then our current staff is funded through ANA, which is primarily for capacity building. So everything that we hope to do with the environment, with our cultural resources, um, right now has been grant funded. We've been very thankful for that. And the majority of the work that we're doing right now is just capacity building. We are hoping to have all of our staff trained to make sure that everyone is knowledgeable and able to consult and actively participate in all of the state agencies, um, the federal agencies that we're working with. And hopefully we can partner, continue to partner with all of these and then more. So if anyone is here from a state agency that we have not worked with, we've actually worked with um, the National Park Services also, they weren't listed, but we've done work with them. Um, we're hoping to be a part of the Virginia Coastal Res Resilience Master Plan as we create our own tribal plan, um, since you know we are in the coastal zone. Um, and the Virginia Cooperative Extension, we work with Virginia Tech and the Virginia State University um, to establish our own food sovereignty and have more, more sustainability on our reservation. So next up, we'll hear um, from Sharon Baxter and Chief Atkins regarding the CZM's focus on the Lower Chickahominy watershed 
and the role that the Pamunkey, or I'm sorry, that the Chickahominy tribe is playing with respect to that project. Good morning. Um, so I should say I'm with um, DEQ and we have been working with uh, Samantha's office now for a couple of years under uh, what we call a performance partnership agreement and, and um, that's just a, an agreement where you work on mutually beneficial projects of all different types and we had had one years ago and we had kind of um, reestablished it I guess it was about two or three years ago and as we were coming up with topics where we wanted to work um, tribes as just the Pamunkey at that point was the only federally recognized tribes that became um, one of our areas of study. So it actually has been really beneficial because we've developed a relationship as we, as Samantha was talking, you know, we're all learning. What does this mean? You know, what should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing, et cetera? So what I'm going to talk about though is um, an example of a project that was ongoing that um, really has kind of changed a little bit by virtue of the um, tribes, the Chickahominy tribe status changing. So this is um, the Coastal Management Program is a networked program that is led by DEQ, but it's really all sorts of agencies, um, PDCs across the coastal zone. Um, and for, uh, I'd say, three or four years, they have been working on the Lower Chickahominy watershed. And um, what I'm going to do is just tell you, you know, why, why they chose this watershed, some of the things that we have funded, and then some of the new opportunities for the tribe. And then I'll turn it over to Chief Atkins. So, so I'm going to go really quickly through this, but there we go. Okay, so it's kind of hard to see, but um, just to give you a little geographic reference, the, the lightly shaded yellow, that is the Lower Chickahominy watershed. And this just shows you it's really the border between you know, New Kent, Charles City, and James City County. So that's the study area. And I should say, um, so we fund this uh, through the Coastal Zone Management Program, but this is really being led by the Richmond Regional PDC. So if there's anybody <laughs> from the PDC here and, and I say anything wrong, please uh, put your hand up. So this is a map of that same area um, with, that is through the Virginia Ecological Value Assessment, which is um, a GIS system that layers scientific and kind of professional judgment on areas of ecological um, value. And you can see the purple areas are outstanding. The bl dark blue areas are very high and the kind of you know, light teal are high. And so you s this is a really um, ecologically important area. And when you, you kind of pull out and do the map of the whole coastal area, it, it really jumps out. And I think next, yeah, this is just kind of the outstanding area. So you see there's a significant amount there. So, as I said, we've been working on this for the last three or four years um, and funded almost $400,000 uh, worth of projects. And just to let you know, so we get funding through NOAA for the coastal program and most of that program, we get about $3 million a year. Most of that goes out to various um, other organizations who do various research and outreach and program development. So just to give you a sense, uh, we had, um, and this is not my area of expertise, a herpetological <laughs> inventory of uh, reptiles and amphibians done by DGIF. And they documented 64 of 69 species and produced all kinds of maps showing abundance of species um, in this area. DCR has done a biological survey um, throughout the counties and looked at seven significant stream reaches, 17 significant natural communities, and 22 rare plant populations. The um, PDC is working with the uh, UVA's Institute of Environmental Negotiation on a, a five-year strategy looking at planning and um, for land conservation and land use across the entire three-county area. George Mason um, just completed a study on the economic costs and benefits of land conservation in, the, in that watershed and actually um, found that there is a, a net benefit to conserving land. And then the um, project that uh, Angela mentioned that um, William & Mary's Coastal Policy Center is working on. So 
I just want to quickly show you a few of the products from these. So this is um, the healthy water sites uh, mapping done by DCR. It's kind of different color scheme, but um, so if you reorient, the, the yellow areas are outstanding significance. The orange, very high, uh, light pink, high significance. So again, it just shows you this is a really important place. There was also a uh, scenic river assessment done um, by students at VCU. And this is actually a, a screenshot of a story map that's available on um, VCU's website. So each one of those dots will show you information and, and beautiful pictures of the watershed. Uh, and then what they concluded was they were doing an assessment of would this uh, river qualify for scenic um, designation and, and their conclusion was yes. And finally, here are just some of the um, pictures from DCR's uh, research. And on the top left, that is an example of extensive beds of globally rare, narrow-leaved spatter dock found in the river. The right shows extensive tidal freshwater marsh, and the lower is Gordon Creek, a tributary of the Chickahominy River, uh, which is a tidal freshwater marsh dominated by wild rice. So as you can see, it's a you know, beautiful place. Um, and all of this study has led us to conclusion it is a place that we, we probably do want to invest in some another strategy that we often use, which is land acquisition. And so the, the Chickahominy were a stakeholder in the project to begin with, but we have now found that based on their federal recognition, they are eligible to be uh, the recipient of land acquisition through the Coastal Zone Management Program. So we're in the early stages of exploring that. It's obviously not something we have done before, but, um, and then just to, as reference, in the past, all of, we have purchased um, land across the state, and particularly on the Eastern Shore, and that's typically been managed by um, state agencies. So this is an opportunity for the Chickahominy to have some land that's waterfront, which you, you don't have right now, right? Correct, yeah, so. So with that, I'm going to, um, do you want me to leave these pictures up? Or do you have a good? Okay, all right, let's I'll turn it over to Chief Ashton. Again, greetings. And I would like to just acknowledge the uh, partnership we've had with the Pamunkey Tribe. Uh, uh, Chief Gray and Lauren and others have really been there to help us uh, navigate these initial steps. It's kind of like you know, trying to drink water from a fire hose. And uh, the, the uh, Pamunkey has, has really stepped up and helped us avoid the pitfalls that they encountered. So again, thank you for reaching out to help us as you have done. I would like to point out that I had the pleasure of working in both, uh, for both uh, Governor Kane and Governor McDonald. Uh, after my tenure with uh, Kane, I was re reappointed by Governor McDonald and have a good relationship with, with, uh, with both of those folks, very good people. I would also like to go back just to Tad, uh, 16, 14. <laughs> and that's the first treaty that I'm aware of that was negotiated between Virginia's indigenous peoples uh, and, and, and the folks from England, uh, those Europeans who came from uh, Western Europe, which we specifically England. So that, that began a uh, formal relationship uh, with, with the colony. And it, that treaty probably provided that rather peaceful, serene, atmosphere that existed when the first English-speaking representative government convened at Jamestown because things went kind of crazy in 1622 after that, and I, I won't talk about it. But, uh, and then I'll go back to the uh, next slide here. If I can key that on. And this, this shows some of the uh, towns and villages of the Chickahominy back up the uh, Chickahominy River. 
these the, these uh, villages, towns, cities were occupied by, by Chickahominy. It goes all the way back to the Diascom Creek. The Paspahay had the dubious distinction of living closest to Jamestown, and Lord Delaware ordered their annihilation in 1610, a scan, scan three and a half years after the settlers landed. Today, that site is governor's land at two rivers, so things do change. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that the, the, the efforts for state recognition actually began in 1978. I was on the school board of Charles City County, and we were uh, availing ourselves of a Title IV Indian education grant, and we had Indian school on Friday nights and on Saturdays, and we were up for renewal of the, of the grant, and there were two questions. Are you federally recognized? Are you state recognized? Well, there were several criteria, but those two stood out. And I said, sure, we're state recognized. My wife was a chair of the committee that uh, administered this Indian education program, so she asked me, and I gave her the good answer, yeah, well, uh, the folks from the county checked the state, and the state said, no, these, the tribe isn't state recognized. So that led to the formation, <coughs> pardon me, the formation of a study commission, and then in 1983, um, the, the Joint Study Commission presented its findings to the General Assembly, and out of, outgrowth of that was the Virginia Commission on Indians, and uh, the Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Upper Mattapani, and Rappahannock tribes were officially recognized by the state. And if I look at the path we were on for federal recognition, it actually began in the 80s when we, we began the administrative process. And we followed that in, in, ad, administrative process uh, through a name change for the organization. It used to be the Bureau of Acknowledgement and Research, and it ended up being Office of Federal Acknowledgement. And we were working that, and the uh, congressional recognition, legislative uh, recognition in tandem. And January 29th, 2018, the, the congressional recognition occurred or, or was approved, became public law 115-121 uh, under uh, President Trump. So January 29th, 2018 was a culmination of, of almost 20 years of, of lobbying Congress for uh, federal recognition, coupled for the Chickahominy with over 30 years of work in the administrative process. Uh, and the thing that really struck me was we were appealing to 435 congressmen and 100 senators, and you could take their knowledge of American Indians and put it all on this drink cap and you know, have room to put the Declaration of Independence on there too. So uh, knowledge was pretty scant. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to digress a little bit. Uh, when you get the podium, you get a lot of license. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about how we got to where we are. The coastal waters, the coastal plain, the tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay are very dear to the Virginia Indians. And by the way, I served on the Chesapeake Conservancy for many years. I served on the VCU Rice River Center and also serve on the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. So to say that I'm in tune with conservation is maybe an understatement. Uh, but, but these waters provide a gateway to our history. It is impossible to probe along the shoreline of the Chickahominy River and its creeks without finding native artifacts. That's the, the fact of life. In, 19, uh, in 1607, there were many Chickahominy towns along the Chickahominy River Diaspin Creek and other tributaries of the Chickahominy River. And again, you, you see those here. The impoundment of the Chickahominy River was completed in 1943 with the construction of a low head dam known locally as, Wal as Walker's Dam. This is a 1,230 acre water supply reservoir located along the New Kent Charles City County line and it provides water uh, to Newport News. The construction of that dam altered the lifestyle of many 
of the indigenous people who relied on fishing, you know, both of the tides uh, to maintain their livelihood. You know, sadly, the dam was constructed without consultation with the Chickahominy Indian tribe. However, that was a small price to pay compared to the tens of tribes who suffered annihilation at the hands of the invaders between 1607 and 1699. To be specific, nine out of 10 of the Indian tribes, nine out of 10 members of those Indian tribes had perished by 1699, and that's not to say the settlers didn't lose a like amount, but they had an infinite supply <laughs> coming in from England. You know, even today, I'm, an, I'm amazed at how the decimation of the tribes is largely discounted by the locality. Case in point, I attended a conference at the Hampton Roads Convention Center earlier this year. I went with my, my uh, middle school daughter, da uh, granddaughter, who, who was making a presentation there. And a representative from that town council offered greetings replete with the history of Hampton. I repeat, replete with the history of Hampton. There was no mention of the annihilation of the tribe that called that very real estate home when the settlers arrived. You know, the Kickapan tribe, the Kiskiak tribe, those tribes no longer exist. Uh, further, I went to uh, my daughter-in-law's naturalization ceremony in Richmond, Virginia. And that ceremony included lots of history of, of the Commonwealth and the United States. No mention of the indigenous people who lived there before the settlers arrived. A and I, I lift that up because it underscores what we as Native people face in Virginia. We, we, we face a constituency that is essentially ignorant of the history of Virginia Indians. You know, we've been spoon-fed a single narrative that doesn't include people of color in our education curriculum. Uh, if you think that's not acceptable, then I would challenge you to let those people who make decisions regarding what we teach our students, let them know how you feel about it. So it, it, it does bother me that, that there's such scant knowledge about, uh, about the history of Virginia Indians. And, and, I, and I think we can. I think we do have the ability to do something about it. You know, the James River has been the discharge point for the Richmond combined sewer overflow for many years. It was. I hope it's completely corrected now, but I doubt it is. In addition to being a deep water commercial shipping waterway, its pristine expanse has been a haven for fishing, boating, and other recreational activities. The aforementioned activities were severely compromised when the river was contaminated with keypone back in the 70s. And it reminded me that in one of uh, John Marshall's answers, Chief Justice John Marshall, who was a very revered jurist, as you know, within the American judiciary, he was asked, uh, to whom does this land belong? And he said, from a divine perspective, I would offer, it belongs to the indigenous people. But I, I don't think they have the intellectual capability to be proper stewards of this land that they were divinely entrusted with. I would offer him to come to Richmond, you know, after a few days of rain and, and, and take a sip of water, uh, you know, down close to Dock Street and let's see if his position has changed at all. Moving on, uh, the two remaining reservations in Virginia saw their land mass reduced as the Commonwealth of Virginia allowed encroachment by non-Indian entities. I say that because the Mattapanai Reservation, the Pamunkey Reservation, are a fraction of what they used to be. 
that Chickahominy and other tribes were, relo were relocated as early as 1646 to areas 60 to 70 miles from their homeland. Treaties promised, treaties promised unfettered access to those lands only to see them set aside as the settlers' hunger, hunger for those lands materialized. We, we learned early on uh, the value <laughs> or lack of saying for written treaty. And if you look at, at the relocation that occurred under Andrew Jackson, the template was set here in Virginia um, as tribes were re re relocated away from their ancestral land. You don't read this in history books, and, and I think uh, there's a reason. <laughs> I don't think uh, the historians want people to know that side of history, but I think it's important for all of us to know that so we can understand where we are and the struggle that the indigenous peoples of Virginia have gone through, one, to maintain the identity, and two, to move ahead. You know, we were in a survival mode for many years because uh, of the very uh, egregious laws that the Commonwealth put in place regarding our status. So if you look at what's happened to, to the waterways and, and the risk inherent to us doing business as usual, you have to stop and think, am I satisfied that the waterways have become receptacles, repositories for plastic, for aluminum cans, for other assorted trash and debris? Are we okay to accept that? So the question becomes, do we really care about our waterways? Or do we simply view them as com convenient repositories for plastic bottles, aluminum drink cans, and other debris? I, I, I restate it because I want you to hear it. And can we muster the same mantra from our non-American Indian brothers and sisters that my people embrace to wit, preserve, preserve Mother Earth for the next seven generations. The Chickahominy Indian tribe is working, I am getting back on subject, <laughs> is working in collaboration with Coastal Zone Management to secure a site along the Chickahominy River to re reinter the remains of our tribal ancestors. Those remains were unceremoniously removed and are now stored on shelves at a prestigious institution of higher learning. Our collective desire is to bear those remains as close as possible to, this, to the site of their original burial. And we're working hand in hand to secure a site to reinter those remains. Uh, I'm very excited about the possibilities that exist working with you uh, and, and, and the relationship that we've built, one of mutual respect, and, and, and a shared desire to, to do what we can protect, to protect, enhance, you know, reinvigorate uh, that coastal zone. You know, to some extent, we'd like to keep some of the majesty a secret <laughs> so we don't attract so many people, but we do want to preserve it and, and we want to build on the successes that we've achieved and we want to gain even greater heights of conservation and, and, and uh, restoration and, and, and just to move forward in a way that we honor this creation uh, that the Creator has, has given us dominion over. So the reality is we have to own this to the person. We have to own our individual responsibilities regarding the state of our environment. We must manage our God-given dominion over our natural resources in a manner that's consistent with the responsibility with which we have been entrusted. We must be keepers of Mother Earth. Thank you. All right. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists.
and we wanted to have a significant amount of time for questions at the end of the panel, and it looks like we've achieved that. So we have about 30 minutes. Um, there are microphones at the end of the aisles, and I could also bring a microphone down if someone would prefer that. Um, but are there any questions? I think the, the steep learning curve for us is even steeper for the Commonwealth. You know, the agencies uh, would work with the tribes as sovereign nations. Uh, it, it's, it's a nation to nation, government to government relationship. And again, I, I recognize for all of the state agencies uh, and, the, and the, even the executive branch, it's, it's a new day in Virginia. Uh, a dearth of knowledge just exists uh, within within the Commonwealth, uh, but the, the big hurdle is, is to first understand that it's, it's a nation-to-nation -nation relationship uh, with sovereign entities. And, and we're, we're going to have to be working together uh, as we both learn what that means from a practical perspective. Uh, it, it, it was stated earlier that, that uh, government funds that heretofore may have gone to the Commonwealth before it got to the tribes would now come directly to the tribes. I think you mentioned that, Samantha, when you were talking. In the spirit of cooperation, you guys just saw Lauren and I decided who should go first. Um, <laughs> no, that, that's exactly right. So the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that once a tribe is federally recognized, it's something called TAS, treated as a state, which means that the federal government has to turn to the tribe at the same time we turn to a state. So funding and programs can go in equal to either, depending on who's decided and been delegated a variety of programs. So we are at the dawn of a new day, and we are at the beginning of a significant learning curve for all of us. We at EPA Region 3 have enjoyed a really positive and longstanding relationship with Virginia DEQ. Some would argue made even more easier by the fact that we've all known Dave Paler forever. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that provides a certain amount of stability um, in thinking and philosophy. And we've really been happy to have that. At the same time now, we have seven new opportunities to build relationships where we then look to our tribal uh, folks as partners, as another state that we also talk to, consult with, that are now open for federal grant dollars. So it, it is the dawn of a new day. And we're very excited to begin building a program in our region that can be appropriately responsive to the tribes that we have. But you did also mention the fact that um, another tribe has had, although much shrunken, still on the same land they've been on for hundreds of years, and that's the Mattapani. The Mattapani remain as state recognized, not federal recognized. It'll be up to them to decide if they want to move through one of these two processes to gain federal recognition. Um, despite that choice, which is their choice, EPA Region 3 has maintained a relationship with that tribe. I personally have been involved with that tribe since 1996 and will remain as such. So as we move down that road, the issues that they have that I would imagine in many ways mirror the ones that you heard Lauren talk about, where you have uh, burial sites, where you have um, uh, issues of cultural significance on their land, and seawater intrusion and climate change concerns are all wrapped up there as well. So. We have our work cut out for us as the federal government going down this road, and we hope to partner collaboratively with uh, Virginia as we learn their role, and obviously with our tribes as they grow and become more self-determinant. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so I would just like to clarify that even though we are, the Pamunkey is federally recognized, um, our reservation is actually held into state trust. So we'll be going through a similar process as other tribes um, look to acquire land. Um, this for us, I think, is defining in the fact that um, you have to have your 
land held in federal trust before you have a tribal historic preservation office. So this is why um, government to government consultation is so important because as of right now, the default is the state um, preservation office. So until we have our land held in federal trust, we don't have a active functioning TIPO. You know, and a, and a shout out to DEQ, they have really been dealing with the tribes in a government-to-government -government relationship kind of manner for, for several years. And uh, DHR, uh, who would be our TIPO, uh, has, really, has really been over backwards to, to accommodate those needs that we have. So the other agencies might look to DEQ to, uh, to learn how to interact uh, with these federally recognized tribes. Thank you for the question. Is it on? Okay, I think that's, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Peter Burke. I'm with Quality Management International. We do environmental training. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs put out an RFP, uh, I think back in October, or we released it in October, regarding EPA violations of 70 some schools and 30, about 30 waterways. I was wondering if any of those violations or if any of that activity is being done in Virginia on these two reservations. Uh, I think a lot of it's out west, but I was just wondering whether there's Virginia application for that Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, RFP. I think you're right that most of them are out west. Um, I would hesitate to speak with any finality until I take a hard look at the data but it certainly hasn't crossed my desk that, that that RFP is centered on any of the lands that are currently held by federally recognized tribes in Virginia or even the state recognized tribe. I think when you go back through Virginia history and you look at where those schools were and where, where the Virginia tribes, state recognized at the time, were allowed to have their schools, it opens a whole new discussion which really goes three or four steps beyond what Chief Atkins shared in terms of the decisions that were made in Virginia in the 1920s about allowing Virginia Indians to talk about their Indianness um, on census forms and other places. So the schoolhouse that's on the Mattapanai Reservation, for example, I think was built by the Baptist Church in the 30s. So I don't think it's in the report that you referenced. Yeah, I, I got the feeling that it was more about um, general, uh, the Indian reservations generally are more environmentally friendly than anybody, but there's violations related to what could be done if they had the money to do it, and I'm assuming that's what they're looking for is to get funding for some of that, and the schools could be lead, could be asbestos, could be stuff that they had no control over but needs to be addressed. But i just wondering if any of that was in Virginia. It sounds like it's all mostly out west. Again, I think that what would have to happen is if all seven of our tribes, be careful, Brian, don't run, um, apply for and receive GAP grants in the next year and a half, two years. Like, he's like, no, no, it's not. So if everybody did that and then was able to do their environmental assessments on any land that they may have or may have access to, whether it's for a, a center where they gathered, a school center, a cultural center, then we'd be able to better answer that question. Right now, we just, have, we just don't have that kind of data. And his, historically, the Virginia tribes didn't necessarily have schools or other gathering places long use that would then have asbestos or lead paint. But I think it's an excellent question. You know, it, we're, we're working with, with DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation, um, on a potential property. And, and due diligence uh, for us has really gone up exponentially because we're trying to ferret out, out those, those very concerns that, that you lifted up. And, and just for information, an aha moment for me, and I was, I was actually warned or, or advised by uh, Chief Gray this would occur, but I really wasn't prepared for it. But and my naivety, I thought federal recognition meant that you'd, you'd go to the BIA for all your needs. Well, you go to HUD, <laughs> you go to the Department of Education, you go to the Department of Homeland Security, all of those agencies uh, we, we have to, to go to individually to get the array uh, of services that would accrue to a, any state in the union or that would accrue to any sovereign entity within the United States. So that was an aha moment for us. And I suspect, Lauren, if, if, if we take it to the state level, it's kind of what we'll be doing here too, uh, working with each individual state agency. And, 
Any other questions from the crowd? I would say that we join the hue and cry of folks like you saying that we need to maintain uh, that Clean Water Act, and, and if we alter it all, we need to beef it up. So when I was introduced, <laughs> you heard that I'm the director of the Office of um, uh, Communities, Tribes, and Environmental Assessment. And while that's accurate, it really hasn't kicked in yet because the realignment, you know, government and paperwork, that hasn't happened. So for the last 20 years, I've been the director of the Office of Enforcement, Compliance, and Environmental Justice. So I've had the unique opportunity of being the central point of contact for all 17 statutes in six states, as well as any new uh, changes in policy or guidance or interpretations due to the ebb and flow of the electoral process. One thing that this administration's made very clear and consistently throughout whichever, whether you're doing enforcement, permitting, or any other program, is that our states are on the front lines, states and tribes are on the front lines, and it is our job to partner with our states and tribes to help them achieve their environmental goals. And in the, in the enforcement context, there's been a series of papers written talking about how the states are not only uh, our partners, but uh, oftentimes um, should be helping to drive the train in, in setting priorities. With that said, I have federally recognized tribes to my left and to my right and the state of Virginia on this panel and each one of them have expressed a significant concern for what you can call anything you want to call, but to me sound a little bit like climate change or the effects of climate change, which is groundwater intrusion, rising sea levels, seawater infiltration, species loss, habitat loss, cultural, uh, uh, the, the concern for loss of, of cultural antiquities. So I'm interpreting my role as helping my states any way I can through advice, guidance, technology, um, relationship building, to help them meet their stated goals. So I don't see a personal conflict that I have now. Because if Virginia consistently says to me, we need your help in uh, your GIS modeling in order to figure out what we need to do for coastal erosion, that's what I'm gonna do. And that's not flying in the face of anything else because my state has asked me to provide technological assistance, and that's what I'll do. Similarly, if Chief Atkins calls us up and says, you know what, we're really concerned about wetlands issues here or whether or not there's violations or whether or not there's wetland spills on parts of our creek, that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go out and look at it. So I think that one could argue that by putting states' rights first, as long as your states ha share the same values that you just stated, sir, there's no, there's no conflict. And I don't know if the state wants to speak to that or anyone else on the panel, but. That's my view of what my role is during this administration. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Steers. I'm with DEQ. And um, I just wanted to kind of add to the uh, discussion regarding the rollback of waters of the U.S. And uh, Virginia is thankfully positioned where we have our water quality protection standards um, are such that we don't believe that there's going to be a significant impact whatever happens. However, we're still going to continue to fight and improve the water quality in Virginia. So um, we don't believe that there's an, an immediate impact from whatever happens on the federal level, but we're, we continue to, to fight any, anything that will, that will have a negative impact on, on our ability to enforce or take compliance actions uh, against standards that we've already developed. And, um, and we work closely with our other states, the, the uh, ACWA, which is an association of state water directors across the country, 
Um, so we're trying to keep an eye too on what impacts that may have on other states, other neighboring states um, with Virginia. But I think uh, we're in a position to at least state that um, our view in looking at, at uh, any potential rollback should have, shouldn't have a, an immediate impact on our ability to protect Virginia's water. I'm just gonna add briefly to that. Um, getting tribal governments to have the status um, for treatment as a state, that would be another reason as to why this would be so important um, so that we can add to and have the authority to have our own water quality standards as well. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? All right, I'll ask one. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I live in Charles City County, but the Chickahominy service area, the Chickahominy ancestral lands and, and what has been translated as service area in, our, in, in the, the law that was signed uh, January 29, 2018, our, our area extends, it, it's, it's multi-county, multi-jurisdictional. So the first step that, that, that I perceive for the Chickahominy would, Chickahominy would be to make sure my county, my resident county, understands the relationship and that a new day has dawned. And, and, and I would foresee working with the Board of Supervisors of Charles City, and then we would go to those other counties that fall within the Chickahominy Tribe service area. And I suspect that model would work for the other six uh, federally recognized tribes. Lauren, you want to pound on that? I mean, I think that's about the way we have to do it. Yes, uh, we've, been, we've been in contact with um, the Board of Supervisors for King County as well. Um, we just actually had a meeting uh, last week, I believe, um, for FEMA uh, with Kingdom County. Um, because our reservation, there's only one entrance, um, and there's also Southern Railway. We have a contract with them. They cross through our reservation um, in two different sections. So if forever there's an accident or some sort of hazardous waste spill or anything like that, um, we're working with the county to know who is contacted, how that's mitigated, um, what the response would be, because we don't have that kind of capacity on our reservation right now. So we, I mean, it's definitely good for the tribes to set up meetings and voice their concerns and make the connections, but I would hope that um, the counties in which the uh, tribes lie would also be the same. One thing to add to that, the federal government, there's something called the LGAC, the local county, don't ask me what it stands for, GAC, <laughs> advisory <laughs> group. <laughs> you know, you've, you've been a fed a long time. There's still things I can't say quickly off the top of my head. I know the mnemonic, I'm just not sure the breakdown. But I would suggest, I don't know whether under the LGAC there's a, a drop down for what do counties do with tribes? 
But I do know that there's a lot of tribes all over America, and I bet you there's counties that have a guide document or a recipe book. And I think that in order to save time and resources, what we'll do for you guys, and by we I mean someone on my staff, Brian, so, um, we're going to reach out to some other um, uh, local government in the LGAC to see if there's something that then we could help you guys get out to the other county. Because it's not the first time this has been an issue. So I would think in, in Colorado, in California, in Washington State, there's got to be like a, a, a county guide to federally recognized tribes. And I, I think we might be able to take some of that burden off by just sharing some data. And, and I think you're right on that. And, and some of the things that, that accrue to federally recognized tribes, the localities find somewhat intimidating because, you know, several, several jurisdiction would reside with, with our tribes if you're on tribal land. Uh, if, if you take land into trust, then the jurisdiction over that land regarding building permits and you know all the county zoning ordinances, we we will work to make ours look like theirs, but we aren't constrained by those county requirements, and it's it's rather intimidating for some of the localities. And, and for Pamunkey, it may be prudent for them to establish uh, a police system. I mean, to, to have jurisdiction, uh, you know, civil and criminal jurisdiction over, over that reservation. So, as I said earlier, and I can't underscore it, I can't emphasize it enough, it's a new day. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> um, going off of what Sandra said about the LGAC, um, as far as I know, which, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the state does have something in place, but it's appointed, like, officials through the state or through the counties and there isn't a specific piece for tribes or tribal governments. Um, so I'm hoping that's something that we would work on yeah. to have a specific appointee for that group. Makes sense. Okay. Another question? Okay, just one other quick question. Um, gets back to this, uh, the RFP. I realize most of the building stuff is probably west, but the 27 violations for water, I would think, would affect Virginia. Are the seven Virginia tribes, and congratulations on getting the recognition, are they working at all with the Maryland tribes, Eastern Shore, and is there any centralized group in the three regions that you've mentioned, uh, I guess four state, five state area, in Washington, D.C.? We met briefly with Cherokee Nation. They've got an office in Alexandria. Does Virginia or Maryland have anything in Washington? So um, unfortunately or fortunately, there are no federally recognized tribes in the state of Maryland, which isn't to say that there aren't communities that haven't gone through the process. Um, and even in Delaware, there are, there's a community, the Lenape's, that, that have, would argue that they've been in existence for 2,000 years and they lack both state and federal recognition. Um, so no, but one of the things we were talking about is historically in the state of Virginia, there was the Virginia Council on Indians and they met regularly and it was one place where the state government and often the feds would come and listen in. It was the third Wednesday every month starting in the late 80s. Um, and I think it just disbanded in 20, 2009, I think. Council on Indians. So I started going what was the Virginia Council on Indians and selfishly, it was very um, convenient for me because it was one-stop shopping. I could go, and whatever the major issues are with the seven folks, I could hear it at once, and I could stay overnight and meet with people the next day and really have an opportunity to hear from them. Right now, that doesn't exist. I'm unclear as to whether or not the tribes and, and Virginia governor's office will decide that that's helpful again with this federal recognition issue. Uh, selfishly, it would certainly help me. Um, but if, if it does, it does. And it'll, but right now, no, there's no office in, Virgi in, in D.C. that I know of as a central hub point. We, we knew who those po people were. I mean, most of us are Southern Baptists, so we have homecomings every year and fried chicken galore. And I mean, <laughs> anyway, so so every year, you know, my folks would go to Pamunkey Baptist Church, Mattapanai Baptist Church. They'd come to my church. Uh, so we've had that relationship for years, and, and those remains that were were uh, removed from a Chickahominy ossuary 
you know, with, with, with some trepidation, some misgivings, we, we allowed bone fragments to be analyzed, and, and they were dated to uh, 600 A.D. And anecdotally, when I was human resource manager at DuPont, you know, on that job, you either have people totally steamed with you or people on the cusp <laughs> of being steamed <laughs> with you. And this one guy said, you know, I wish you'd just go back where you came from. I said, well, you know, I can do it in 30 minutes. How long would it take you? Uh, so we do have a, a, you know, a firm <laughs> foothold in, in, in this land that we call home. And it's not a stretch, you know, to say that the Pamunkey and Chickahominy and other tribes, you know, have, you know, over a thousand years, many more than a thousand years, several millennia, uh, in, in the place that we today call home. To me, I think that that's pretty significant. Yeah. And we, we probably have time for one more question if there's anybody else from the crowd that would like to ask one. I'm not seeing anyone moving. Um, <laughs> so I guess I would just ask if there are any thoughts that the panelists would like to leave us with. Um, if you'd want to identify what you see as the greatest opportunity moving forward or a lesson that's been learned over the work that's been done over the past couple of years with this changing landscape. From my perspective, um, I'm really looking forward to working with seven federally recognized tribes as they um, decide First, they have to get all the information and then decide on what schedule they want to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are now availing to them. I, as I stated, we have, I personally have been able to enjoy a really good working relationship with DEQ and DCR, when it was back with Dave Johnson three times. Um, so I'm really looking forward to working collaboratively with my state partners. I'm also looking forward to helping be the key for you guys with some of the other federal agencies because um, it can be daunting. It's daunting sometimes when I call HHS and they don't call me back. So um, I'd like to see that, w have you guys feel that we are one-stop shopping for things that you can't, a key that you need to find, a door that you need to open, or a time frame. Um, we see ourselves as being people to help you get where you need to be. And if we're not the answer, we'll tell you we're not, and we'll tell you who we think might be. So, um, and you know, for the, for the public in Virginia, I think it's really an exciting time because you'll have the opportunity to hear stories you hadn't heard before. You just heard some today from Chief Atkins, you've heard some from, from um, Lauren Fox as well, and you're gonna continue to hear those. And as these folks, as part of the federal recognition, they get a bigger voice. And with a bigger voice gets, gets more of a story. And it's part of your story as Virginians. So I think it's pretty exciting that you have the opportunity to hear more about your own state history that heretofore you hadn't had the opportunity to hear. And you get to hear it from the people who are the descendants of those who were here way before any of the rest of us. So I'm excited about that. Um, I would say the biggest and most exciting thing for me um, is opening up communication to partnerships. We've worked with DEQ and DCR, um, NPS, IHS, all these lovely acronyms. Um, and having any state or federal agency come to us and ask questions and ask how we want to be consulted or you know what our needs are is very helpful. I think some people are intimidated by the fact that there is so much information out there, but I would much rather have too much than too little. Um, so anyone in the audience that has a question or an idea for us or any way to better help serve us as a tribal nation or you know Virginia in general because we do have a lot of the same issues and overlapping problems. Um, well, the guidance that we've been given from the governor's office is that the Commonwealth wants to have good relationships, and so I think we are, you know, leaning a lot on EPA with their expertise and in trying to build those relationships. And I think our challenge um, kind of gets to um, what Lauren just said. You know, DEQ. Is, you know, it's a complicated um, business, and you know we don't want to overwhelm people with information. Although Lauren has indicated she wants to be overwhelmed, <laughs> so we need to figure out you know what is the um, most appropriate level of interaction so that it's meaningful. And um, so I think I think that's it is. I mean, it's very interesting, and, and I'll 
tell you, we, um, I mentioned we had this performance partnership agreement with EPA, so we've been kind of working on this generally for a couple of years. And one of the things um, a colleague and I put together, a, a quick PowerPoint we've been doing at you know, different program manager meetings, and it's, it's evolving. Each time we do it, it's a, it, we know more information. And, um, and people are really interested and really fascinated and have a lot of questions, which often we can't answer, you know, you know, to be determined, or, or you know, call me three weeks from now, and maybe I'll have the answer. But so it, it is very exciting. We're looking at it as an opportunity. And I, I guess, three observations. I, I think you will see uh, these tribes uh, pull together in a way that, if it doesn't exist in the state, Samantha, it will exist with the tribes, where you can have a contact that can muster, that can that can get all those tribes together. I think, you, you stay tuned, you, you will probably see some published works uh, regarding these tribes. Uh, we're inundated with requests, <laughs> you know, could you write a book or, or do you need any help writing a book telling your story? So uh, at this point in our history, I think you'll see at a minimum seven tribes telling their story in their own words, and I think it will be prudent for the uh, State Department of Education to embrace these and, and put them as part of our curriculum. You know, our history has been held hostage for well over 400 years. It's time to pay the ransom. It's time to redeem uh, those stories that have been held hostage. And then finally, we uh, really want to work with the agencies, but, you know, I, I wouldn't get a warm and fuzzy feeling if you came and offered me a blanket. <laughs> Though I fully appreciate and understand the comment, being a student of history myself, um, I was really fortunate about four years ago when I asked um, Lauren's cousin to come up to Region 3 in Philadelphia. I actually came down and got her in Fort Meade and, and did a teleconference. And she was able to share with us her dissertation research on the Pamunkey, which was a study of the change in the ceramics as found in the kilns that she excavated on tribal land. And I've got to tell you, you know, it's always hard when you work in an environment to try to have a women's uh, speech day and see how many people show up. Amazingly well attended. It, it was because it's social anthropology. It's who was there when, how did it change, what were the impacts. Things like the change in the way the teacups were fired. Was there a pattern on the outside? Did the pattern change? Was there a handle? These things showed evidence of making products to be sold to the English settlers in 16 whatever or 1740. So it, it struck a good nerve in terms of telling the history. I think it's an important part of our history. And I said ours. Because I think that we're at a time in this nation where we can decide that we're all, we all should have a voice or only some should have a voice. And I would argue that all of us should have a voice. And I mean all of us. So it's our history. And we're lucky to have people that want to spend the time researching it and then sharing it with us. And that could be the history of the first Swedes that settled in Virginia or the original people of Virginia. So I look forward to hearing all those histories. You know, I had, uh, I lectured at UVA for several years and from graduate students to exchange students from other countries. And when I would tell my story, the, these folks, they became incensed. Why didn't we learn that in school? Uh, so, so there's a hunger, there's a thirst for, for a history that, that tells, as you suggested, our collective history. Uh, you know, my history, you know, uh, the director of DCR, Clyde Christman, we have a shared history. We have a collective history, but uh, not all sides are told. And, and I pick on him because I know him well. But when I look across this room, if, if you're Virginians, we have a collective history, but you've only been exposed, you've been essentially exposed to a single narrative. Well, times, they are a change. <laughs> well, I think that's about all the time that we have, so thank you again to our panelists.